Good morning, church. Welcome. Welcome to all of you here and all of you out there online. Hello. We are glad that you're here on this gorgeous day. And um, want you to be very welcome here. A few announcements before we begin. The new newsletter was mailed out this week. You should have received it. If not, please let us know, and we will make sure that you get one. Also, next week, August 27th, hard to believe it's the end of the month, is a busy day here. We will be having um, our kickoff of the season of blessing. We will be blessing the backpacks. We, our goal is 100. We have a bunch more to put out, but please keep bringing them in if you want. and. Uh, We'll bless them all next week. Also next week, right after church at 1130, there will be a second hour where you can come and hear about our virtual reality project, learn more about it, ask any questions that you might have. This will be a hybrid session so that it will be also available for folks who are online through a Zoom link, which we will get out to you during the week. Let's see, what else? Oh, the parking lot. <laughs> How could I forget? The parking lot this, com this coming week will be completely being worked on, so you're not going to be able to come in to the parking lot during the week. There is, uh, next Sunday, it might be finished, but it might not, but there is parking across the street in Wintonberry Mall, and we will help keep you safe coming across the street. So with that said, Yes. If you use the mic, because people online don't hear it if you don't use the mic. I don't, I don't think they need a mic from me. Oh, oh, sorry. The parking lot's going to be done this week. Everything working perfectly. The finished coat will be laid Friday. Uh, by Sunday, it'll be well set. It should should be fine, set fine. If anything, if they were to have to finish on Saturday, when you come in on Sunday, you'll be able to drive on it. But one of the things you can do on new, new Amosite is if you, your car is still and you spin the wheels, you'll cut it. So if you can just remember, you know what I'm saying, just if it's still soft, then just try and be moving when you turn your wheels or it will cut it. Thank you, David. Let's see. So I'm going to, um, Pastor Sean is obviously not here, I'm, and I forgot to introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Carolyn Delgado, and I'm one of the deacons here, and we are delighted that you are all here worshiping with us. Um, Reverend David Runes is going to be leading worship today, and we're also delighted to have David here with us. Who, he and Patty joined, oh, what, a year ago, started attending, and are very active in our community of faith. And we're delighted to welcome you to lead worship today. Good morning. I'm de delighted to be here. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we join in reading responsively the call to worship. The words will be displayed on the screen. Please stand if you're able. The Lord is our strength and our might. He has become our salvation. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Please remain standing as we join in singing our opening hymn, Jesus calls us. Again, the words will be displayed on the screen.
remain standing as we join in our unison prayer. Creator God, distant yet near, we gather as witnesses to your promise that if we seek you with all our hearts, we will find you. Be among us this day. Accept our praise and the yearnings of our hearts. Help us change the narrowness of our vision and the smallness of our living. Make us new again with your holy grace. Grant us the maturity to accept your many gifts in humility and to use them with faithfulness to advance your kingdom. Through Jesus, your anointed Son, we pray. Amen. Later in our scripture lesson, we'll be hearing about the peace that Jesus has promised us, so it's appropriate that we now share that peace with one another. Let's pass the peace of Christ. I invite you now to give your attention to uh, Jonah Garcia as he sings, My God, how endless is thy love. everybody today? Good. We're going to play a game today. And all of you are going to play as well. The game is two truths and a lie. I don't lie. I don't like lying. So I'm calling the game two truths and a doubt. Hmm. I am going to say things about me and you have to tell me if it's the truth or if you doubt it. You ready? I have a cat named Levi. Anybody? When I was mm, maybe nine, I rode a horse bareback in South Dakota. True. OK. Um, in 1986, 
I was in training to be a race car driver. People of God, it's true. <laughs> but you did have a doubt. Yeah, that doesn't sound like me, but it was me. <laughs> Might have been 1987. It was powder puff. I failed the test, so I did not do it, consequently. But there's a man in the Bible named Thomas, and he doubted that Jesus was alive. But it was true. He, didn't, he wanted to see it to believe it. I bet you all want to see me drive a race car. <laughs> believe it. It happened. It's the same kind of thing. Unless you see something, it's hard to believe. And that's like our faith. Our faith in Jesus, we don't see Jesus as a person, but Jesus is with us. And that's what we have to do is believe that it's true. Okay? We're going to talk about that upstairs. Let's go and have some fun. A race car in front of anybody. As we come to our time of prayer, I'm aware of two concerns that have been shared with me. Uh, first, Pastor Sean would appreciate our prayers for his uh, friend and mentor, Reverend Ball, Bob uh, Fallhaber. You might remember Bob preached here a while ago when Sean was on vacation. Uh, Reverend Fallhaber had to be taken to the hospital recently for some serious medical issues, so let us pray for Bob and his speedy recovery. Uh, also, let us continue to pray for uh, Judy Joseph, a member of this church who is facing some uh, serious medical issues also. I invite you now to join me as we uh, pray together. Creator God, we are so thankful for the sunshine today and the lower humidity. We're grateful for the beauty of the world around us. And we thank you especially for Sunday when we can pause from our busyness and for this special sanctuary, this place of refuge, where we feel your presence in a deeper way. We know, Lord, that you are always with us, and yet uh, the noise of the world often distracts us. Thank you that we can be here today. Thank you for those worshiping with us online. Thank you for the promise of peace. For often, Lord, we are troubled by things happening to us and those we love, by injustices that are being inflicted on many innocent people. We thank you for this church and its many ways of working for justice, for peace, for racial understanding, for acceptance of those who perhaps have a different sexual orientation. Thank you for the many ways that we are ministering in Bloomfield and this state and your world. We pray that you will bring our pastor back to us renewed from his time of vacation. Thank you for his leadership. This morning, Lord, we lift up especially Bob, your servant. We pray that you will be with him and his family in this anxious time. Bless the medical staff that will be attending to him. We pray for his full and speedy recovery. We pray for uh, Judy, that you would be with her, Lord. You know her needs. We believe in the power of prayer, and we lift her up and pray that she will be back on her feet again soon. 
We're mindful of Barbara and Lisa and their needs as well, Lord. There are many others uh, undergoing a treatment for cancer, perhaps. We just pray that your blessing and your healing might be felt as you continue to work in their lives. We pray again for the people of Maui as they try to rebuild their lives after a terrible fire, and for all who are experiencing the effects of climate change through fire, through flooding, through terrible heat. Forgive us, Lord, for what we have done to the world that you entrusted to our stewardship. Help us each to do the small things that can make such a big difference Help us to reduce our carbon footprint. Help us to be better stewards of your creation. And thank you for the solar panels that are working in our church. We are making our own effort to help to lessen the temperature of our world. We pray that you will continue to speak to us during this service. We thank you for the music. Thank you for the lesson that we are about to hear. We pray that it might inspire us to be better disciples. Thank you for putting up with our mistakes. Thank you for giving us the ability to share good news with others. We pray, Lord God, all of this in the authority of your Son, Jesus, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The reading this morning is from John chapter 20, 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them. When Jesus came, so the other, di so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them again and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other, thing, other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God.
Thank you, Sandy. Before we look at our scripture lesson, uh, let me try to clear up some possible confusion. In the gospel written by John, Jesus met with 10 of his closest disciples in what we have come to call the upper room in Jerusalem on the evening of that first Easter Sunday. This was probably the same room where Jesus and his followers had eaten the Last Supper on Thursday evening. In the meantime, Jesus hung himself out of shame for his betrayal of Jesus on that same Thursday night. And Thomas was absent, so there were ten disciples who met with Jesus, the risen Lord, on that Easter evening. Jesus gave these 10 disciples his spirit, the Holy Spirit, as he had promised earlier in John chapters 14 and 16. In the Gospel of Luke, however, we find a different story. On the evening of that first Easter, Jesus had supper with two otherwise obscure disciples in the village of Emmaus, seven miles outside of Jerusalem. When he broke bread with them, we are told in Luke that they recognized that he was the risen Lord. Suddenly, Jesus vanishes <laughs> during the supper and those two otherwise unknown disciples run all the way back to Jerusalem where they find all 11 of the followers of Jesus and were told their companions. And they say, we have seen the risen Lord. And while this large group is trying to process this information, Jesus himself shows up among them. But Luke says nothing about the Holy Spirit giving given to that group of people. In the, the book of Acts, which is the sequel to Luke, we are told that the 11 disciples elect a 12th disciple to replace Judas. And then on Pentecost, roughly 50 days after Easter, Jesus gave his spirit to those 12 disciples. Now these discrepancies remind us that the Gospels are not history books written to answer the question, who was Jesus of Nazareth? No, the Gospels are theological stories written to help us discover who the risen Lord is for us today. And there is more than one way to answer that question, who is Jesus? Which is why we have four different Gospels and the letters of Paul, Peter, James, and John. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at this story from John's Gospel. You may want to keep your Bible open again to John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. The first lesson that I find in this text is that being a Christian means spending time with Jesus. On that first Easter Sunday, the disciples were filled with fear and grief. They had seen their teacher take his last gasping breath on Friday. They saw his lifeless body placed in a borrowed tomb. All their hopes had been dashed to pieces. It seemed that following Jesus for three years had been a total waste of time. Life had returned to a dull, meaningless routine. 
But then, says John, Jesus came and stood among them. And he offered them peace. And to guarantee that they would always feel his presence, Jesus gave them his spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the creator God who first breathed life into Adam. At that time, the disciples were given full life, life in its fullness. So the text invites us to ask, Am I spending time with Jesus each day? We do this, of course, through prayer. But that means more than asking Jesus for things for ourselves or others. Prayer also means praising Jesus, thanking him for all that is good in life, and looking for him in the simple pleasures that add joy to every day. We also spend time with Jesus when we meditate upon God's word. We are told that Jesus is that word made flesh. And Jesus told the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it is they that testify about me, John 5, 39. Indeed, we're told that the Holy Spirit helps us find Jesus in God's written word. In John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will remind you of all that I have said to you. If you want to know Jesus and have his peace, you really must read the Bible. Otherwise, we might not really be following Jesus. We might be following a, a fiction of our own imagination. And thirdly, I think we spend time with Jesus when we hang out with other believers. Jesus appeared first to 10 of his followers, according to John, but then he came back again so that Thomas could also experience the presence of the risen Lord. Wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, said Jesus, I am there among them, Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. It is impossible to be a Christian apart from the body of Christ, his church. We need each other for support, guidance, correction, and encouragement. The second lesson that I glean from this passage is that disciples have a duty to tell others that their sins have been forgiven. Verse 23 is often misunderstood. I do not think that Jesus is giving us the power to forgive someone else's sins. No, the Bible tells us that only God can forgive sins. See, especially Mark chapter 2, verse 7. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 promises, If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The first letter of John, chapter 1, verse 9, adds, If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My job as a believer is to tell people what God in Christ has done for me. 
and then to invite them to allow Jesus to lift the burden of their sin from them as well. In his commentary on John, William Barclay, the British theologian, said regarding verse 23, this sentence lays down the duty of the church to convey forgiveness to the penitent in heart and to warn the impenitent that they are forfeiting the mercy of God. It is grace that I tell my friends about, not the temperature of hell. You get that? <laughs> The third truth that I find in this text is, for me, the most important. In a sermon preached last year, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of West Hartford preached on Jesus' statement that he is the way back to God. Reverend Stacy Emerson pointed out that our journey of faith is much more like a twisty, confusing labyrinth than a clear, straight road back to God. You know what a labyrinth is? It's a maze. <laughs> Oftentimes you have to turn around and go back in a different direction. It takes a while <laughs> to get to the center, which is the point. <laughs> it slows us down. In the New Revised Standard Version, verse 29 of our scripture lesson reads, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I would put it slightly differently. Happy are those who have arrived at believing. Again, verse 31 tells us that the Gospel of John was written so that you may come to believe. Following Jesus is a lifelong journey. I disagree with my evangelical friends who view salvation as a one-time decision. Usually they will ask, brother, sister, when were you saved? And the standard reply goes something like this. Well, I gave my heart to Jesus during evening vespers around a campfire at Silver Lake on July 2nd, 1960. <laughs> or, I became a Christian during a Billy Graham crusade in New Haven <coughs> on February 3rd, 1952. The implication is that following Jesus is a one-shot deal. <laughs> one minute you aren't a disciple, and the next minute you're a card-carrying member of the Jesus Club <laughs> with all the rights and privileges thereof, if only it were that easy. As I see it, there are two problems with this one-and-done approach to discipleship. Firstly, I think we set people up for unnecessary guilt. Initially, brand new Christians feel really close to Jesus. <coughs> they agree with the poet Robert Browning who wrote, God is in his heaven, all's right with the world. But then they get laid off from work and spend months unemployed and they begin to doubt their salvation. Or a family member is diagnosed with cancer, or their spouse starts showing signs of dementia. Or they watch the news on TV where 15 million people so far have died from COVID-19 worldwide. And they see thousands of innocent people, civilians being maimed, killed, or displaced in Ukraine. And they think, I should be in heaven right now. 
So why does it feel like I'm in hell? Wouldn't it be better to tell people right up front that faith is a lifelong journey? And along the way, there are going to be setbacks and pitfalls and times when we feel utterly lost. What matters is that we keep stumbling along until, by God's grace, we finally reach our destination. The second problem with the one and done approach to faith is that it can create complacency. I made my decision to follow Jesus, so there's nothing more that I need to do. You know, perhaps it's unfortunate that we think of America as a Christian nation. If everyone around me is a disciple, then following the crowd is the same thing as following Jesus. But what if there are laws and traditions and systems in place that are inherently unjust and that should be rejected by disciples of Jesus? What if keeping up with the Joneses is contributing to global warming and the pollution of the very creation that Jesus came to redeem? <clears throat> Every day, I have to resist the temptation to conform to this world if I am going to follow my crucified Lord. Every day, I have to decide to follow Jesus. It seems to me that the Apostle Paul is a perfect example of faith as a lifelong journey. Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus wasn't the end of his spiritual journey. It was a new beginning. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians 3, verses 10 through 14. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul adds, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter, of our faith. For the apostle, following Jesus isn't a 25-yard sprint to the finish line. <laughs> it's a marathon requiring discipline, stamina, and perseverance if we hope to finish what we first began when we said yes to Jesus. Recall that Paul advised, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. So let me recap what we have hopefully learned from today's scripture lesson in John. 
Jesus wants us to spend time with him. He wants us to be at peace with God because our sins have been forgiven and to invite others to experience that same peace. And Jesus wants us to follow him in the big and small decisions that we make every day of our lives. Yes, Christ expects a great deal of his followers, but he has given us the Holy Spirit to empower us, the scriptures to guide us, and loving companions to keep us company on the exciting journey of faith. Thanks be to God. And all God's people say, We've come to the point in our service for our time of gratitude. Giving here is an opportunity, never an obligation. So for those of you who may have not been here before, we don't pass a plate during this time. There are several ways that you can give. One is by uh, when you leave this morning, you can put something in the basket here or the box out there. You can use the cards in your pew that have the QR code. You can also give um, online. So we encourage you to give if you believe in what we are doing. We're trying to build God's kingdom here on earth. So let's enjoy the music during this time of giving. Thank you, that was absolutely beautiful. Do we have any joys to lift up? Ozma. Eustace is back, yay. Other joys. Don't be shy. I have a joy. I uh, was away for several weeks and got refreshed and I'm delighted to be back here. Um, 
It's great to see everybody again, and uh, let us pray. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for the many blessings that we have. Thank you for this beautiful fall, almost fall day. Thank you for the many gifts that are given here, either gifts of time, gifts of resources. We are a blessed community, and we are eternally grateful to you for all these blessings. Amen. announce that we will now have the closing hymn. So please rise in body or spirit while we sing the closing hymn. The word should be on screen. <laughs> After the service, I hope you will join us for a time of uh, good food and conversation in the Fellowship Hall. Just follow the hallway. And uh, thank you for being here this morning. Enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. Now, may the Lord bless and protect you. May God's face radiate with joy because of you. May God be gracious to you show you God's favor, and give you peace now and always. Amen. <laughs>